Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon. I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University and welcome to Vlog 283. The politics of publishing. And just a reminder, I define politics as the struggle over meaning. And this vlog in many ways is partnered with an earlier vlog I did, The Politics of Citation. And as with that earlier vlog, there's some very controversial big arguments that are being made in this vlog. Feel absolutely free to disagree with them, agree with them, or just ponder them going forward in your career. And I'd particularly like to dedicate this vlog to Anne Lorraine. Anne particularly wanted me to think about and talk about with her and everybody else to think about who we are, where we publish and why. And that is my project for the day. But also I am responding to a series of provocative blogs. And when I say the word provocative, I mean basically I've been banging my head against a wall for much of the last four weeks in response to these blogs. And I also wanted to finish with DORA, the Declaration on Research Assessment. If you need some inspiration, I think probably DORA will give it to you. Okay, but I wanted to start with the trigger, something that really made me realise, okay, this is the time to think about the politics of publishing. And this debate at its most grotesque can be configured as Māori tanga Māori versus science. I wish I was joking. And can I do a big shout out to my mate Byron? Byron, you give me amazing sources and ideas every single day. You are a light in my life, Byron. So Māori tanga Māori has many definitions, but at its most basic, it is an understanding of the ancestry of Polynesian histories and how that ancestry manifests in contemporary Māori culture, language, knowledge and peoples. Powerful. Now in the last week of July 2021, some scientists based at the University of Auckland wrote a rather enraged letter to the listener. We don't really have an equivalent of the listener in Australia. I won't tell you why, but the listener is basically a nice sort of middle-class magazine-y thing that talks about media and culture and ideas and so forth, right? So the listener. And seven professors signed this long letter to the listener and they expressed their worry that a working group was transforming Aotearoa New Zealand's curriculum to recognise a parity between Matoranga Māori and other bodies of knowledge. Okay, so this is an ontological discussion. And that's great, we need more ontological discussions. But it was also a moment of questioning of colonisation, decolonization and maybe just maybe just maybe a light of post-colonialism so the seven professors from auckland attacked the course that was supposedly embedding maori knowledge into the science curriculum and what was the course doing well i'll use a quote directly from the course syllabus details quote to promote discussion and analysis of the ways in which the sciences have been used to support the domination of a Eurocentric view. End of quote. And of course, those Eurocentric views include how Māori knowledge has been demeaned and marginalised and erased to allow colonisation to occur. OK, so this course was discussing the very nature of knowledge and how knowledge is used by the powerful to continue their power. Oh yeah, oh yeah, come on. So we're, te we're teaching epistemology, methodology, ontology here. And I tell you what, that's a pretty interesting way to spend a day, isn't it? Now, this sort of discussion seemed great and pretty obvious to me, but clearly not to these seven Auckland-based professors. They argued that <laughs> 
indigenous knowledges and languages and people may be important for, quote, local practices and policy, but, quote, falls far short of what could be defined as science itself. End of quote. So, Mataranga Māori may help science, but it's not science. Okay. Wow. I wish in my daily life I had that degree of epistemological, methodological and ontological certainty in my knowledge creation on a daily basis. Now, science is many things, but one thing it's not, one thing it's not, is closed off to alternative arguments and evidential basis. It's not closed off against the testing against alternative ideas. And we also do need to recognise, you know, hashtag no pressure, that, that colonisation was fuelled through science. Remember that James Cook's expeditions were called scientific expeditions. I mean, this is not hard stuff, right? And also, just for interest, why are we creating a binary opposition between white science and Māori knowledge? How's this happening? And of course, this is a false binary opposition. There are lots of views of science and there are incredibly exciting, unbelievably exciting relationships being created between indigenous knowledge systems and biology, chemistry and physics. Now, the point of decolonization, the actual point, is to create an openness to knowledge systems to ensure that we experiment and we explore and we test in multiple contexts. So Mataranga Māori is <laughs> not antithetical to Western science. So knowledge systems improve when they dialogue. And I've seen, for example, as a head of school, it was a privilege to see this, one of the PhD students in my school presented an incredible PhD looking at the relationship between astrophysics and indigenous sky stories. This stuff is amazing. So in many ways, this complexity, this delicate series of dialogues is the point of a university. This is what we're meant to be doing, team. So science is not a universal knowledge system. The humanities are not a universal knowledge system. Remember, through much of history, scientific methodologies excluded indigenous knowledges and still described itself as universal knowledge. Okay, so all knowledge systems improve when we reflect on the creation of that knowledge and that is why refereeing exists so that we as scholars reflect on our knowledge system through the views of referees. So to use Māori phraseology, whaka papa for me really captures the project, the new project of a university as much as the project of identity. So whaka papa explains really how we create and understand knowledge better than any other term that I know. Now, at its most basic, whakapapa is de described as genealogy, right? And, and that's not a great definition. I, in my head, when I think about it, it's about understanding the layers and the layering of knowledge, like skin, the layering of knowledge. So if every PhD student started with, what is the whakapapa? What's the ontology? What's the methodology? What's the epistemology? Then you know what? Knowledge will transform because we start to focus on relationships. Now, in Australia, I've always asked the question, what is the problem that you're trying to solve through this research? And I've realised uh, that that's a problematic first question. I'm forgetting some steps. And that's the nature of decolonization. We all reflect on ourselves and go, yeah, that was a mistake. I've left out a series of steps that I needed to consider. And therefore, what decolonization has taught me is that we need a series of mitigating steps. So what is the whakapapa? And that changes radically how researchers think about knowledge and their projects. Now, this is not an Aotearoa New Zealand question. This is a question that asks all of us as researchers to think about who we are, 
what we do and why. And that's powerful and that's important and that's integrity and that's courage. And it doesn't hide behind empiricism, assuming that particular methodologies and epistemologies, they're the pathway to truth. But this recent debate, I think, has opened up a series of very important conversations for us to have about knowledge and how knowledge changes. So when you are thinking about where to publish and why, it is always a significant moment, I think, to remember the decolonizing moment and project. And indigenous knowledges, I would argue, must always remain our first lens. But there are lots of decisions that we all make about knowledge and about where we are going to be published. And recognising and remembering that first crucial Indigenous lens, let's get into the <laughs> academic commentaries about publishing and PhDs that have simply driven me crazy in the last few weeks. Now, Yanis Gabriel wrote a, a blog about... PhDs and the PhD students role in research. Okay, going well, that's great, knock yourself out. And he particularly talked about the pressure to publish and the consequential mental health issues and concerns that emerge in doctoral candidates. Now that is welcome, that is important, that is terrific, boom. But then the blog took a really dark turn, dark turn. He stated, Quote, <laughs> imagine that 80% of all research outputs in the social sciences produced in the last five years were destroyed without a trace. Would the world in any meaningful way be a worse place? End of quote. Okay. So firstly, once more, yawn. The social sciences are being summoned as problematic knowledge, knowledge that's not that important, yawn, yawn, yawn. But let's persist and dig into the argument that Gabriel presents. He targets for this commentary, his evidential base is the 880,000 papers on innovation, the 945,000 papers on identity, and no surprise here, the 31,500 articles on gender, and yes, the 33,000 articles on entrepreneurship, all published between 2015 and 2019. He states, quote, would anybody care if the thousands of research gaps that these articles claim to fill remain empty forever? I believe that in spite of strong disagreement about how the 80% may be selected, which areas should be culled and so forth, an overwhelming number of citizens, including scholars themselves, would agree that a loss of 80% of academic papers would be a lesser evil than, say, the loss of 80% of the work done by primary school teachers or 80% of the work done by social workers, garbage collectors or bus drivers. In fact, I would submit that many academics would welcome the disappearance of 80% of all, inverted commas, research papers, including in their own field, as being essentially meaningless clutter. End of quote. Wow. Wow. Okay, well, let's start. Firstly, note the false binary. Do you notice there's no connection at all between recognising the profound value of the work of teachers and social workers and garbage collectors and bus drivers, odd choice, eh? That work and valuing the contribution of research in the social sciences. That is a false binary. Secondly, you'll notice that it's the research on innovation, entrepreneurship, identity and gender. That's the problem. All right, okay. Also notice 
how the argument is constructed. Now, I call the Trump, this the Trumpian model of constructing an argument, but actually it's called the populist model of constructing an argument. And what it means is that the populist methods use phrases like most people, all of us, everyone I know, or indeed many academics, and the overwhelming number of citizens. Right. So none of this, of course, is evidence. They're just phrases like most people. You'll never know. Right. And it's like, you know, that bully at high school that a lot of us knew. Right. Yeah. The dreadful bully said, everybody thinks you're ugly. Right. Now, that's not actually evidence. It's just cruel and it's just a bit nasty. But let's think through the point being made here without the sort of bonkers side arguments attached. Would the world change? if 80% of the articles published in the last five years were never published? Well, firstly, we can never know that because the world is as it is. But also notice the weird subjects he chooses to supposedly make his point. The four straw men <laughs> and women and non-binary identifying, horses of the zombie apocalypse. So let's translate those four weird topics into, say, some of the big high publishing areas in the sciences. So what if this case was made about technology, digitization, cancer, nanotech? Okay, now these are big areas, wow. These are important areas and hundreds upon hundreds of articles, we might even be in the thousands of articles, are published every single week. Now, who am I and who are you to describe this research as, quote, meaningless clutter, end of quote. So let's get real. Let's stop the name calling. Let's stop the targeting of disciplines and get into this. Now, as most of you know, I am a big believer in reading. Reading is everything to me. And, you know, even though research is outside of my current job, I read. And I have to give myself a target. I have to find time in my week to read. So I give myself a target of five books a week and 40 refereed articles a week every single week. And that's the baseline. And I do that reading because I feel humble. I feel humble that I've had the opportunity to engage with these powerful ideas that people have sacrificed their life to study and understand. And I have never, never in my entire career, in my entire life, read an article or read a book and even thought, let alone said, even thought, oh, I wish they hadn't written that. Oh, that's a bit of, that's a, bit of a mess, isn't it? Haven't that thought hasn't even come into my mind. And remember, I also force myself to read outside of my comfort zone. I don't read in a bubble. I force myself to read alternative arguments, not to disagree with them, not to agree with them, but to understand the argument. So what I thought I'd do is share a little bit of advice that I learnt, luckily, as a very, very young person, uh, as an early career academic. And I was very lucky. I've had some some lucky breaks in my career, and I don't, never knew where this break came from. But very early in my career as a very junior lecturer, uh, I got an opportunity from Oxford University Press, Oxford University Press, to contribute a very, very long chapter, 15,000 words plus, to their year's work in critical and cultural theory, right? Great, great book. And my chapter was on Australian popular culture and media studies. So I was paid to write this review, my goodness me, and I got all the articles and the books for free. Can you imagine? What a joy. And it was such a privilege. And I think I did that chapter for eight years, for eight years. And by the way, I would have kept going. Uh, a certain gentleman professor in the United Kingdom decided he didn't want chapters on Australian popular culture and media anymore. Bless. But this job was what I described as a completist job. So that meant that I had to read everything each year, all books published and all journal articles produced in Australian media and popular culture, right? That's what I had to read. And then I had to write that up into a cogent way so that it would people would be able to find the books and the ideas that they're interested in, right? Now, as you can imagine, I disagreed with a lot of what I was reading. But my view, 
my opinion had absolutely nothing to do with this job. And my job, and I saw it at the time, and I see it to this day, my job was to connect this publication with an audience that might not know that it exists. And that was particularly important from an Australian perspective because it was being read around the world. People may not have read Australian media and popular culture stuff. So my job was for people who would never think of these ideas, read my chapter and go, oh, that sounds interesting. I might find that. So I did about eight years of this job. I loved it. Now I read a lot. It's a big job. And there were huge chapters to write. But the greatest lesson that I carried forward in my academic career from this early job was that every article and every book has value for a particular audience. But we just have to seek out and find that audience. Knowledge is always valuable for someone. So think about our times right now, where we're living right now. Think about all the blogs, the tweets, the TikToks, the Instas. Think about all of that. Now, do you really think in a time like this, the greatest problem in our culture is the proliferation of refereed scholarship? Do you really think that's the problem? Now, in this culture and in this time, do we really think that intelligent people writing about important, intelligent ideas is a waste. Now, as I've often said, the issue is not too much information. The issue is a lack of information literacy. The problem is not too much knowledge. The problem is we're yet to find strategies to connect that knowledge to enable citizenship. Now, please feel free to disagree with me. I present these ideas and please disagree. They're never presented as some sort of idea that you have to disagree with. I often disagree with myself quite frequently. But do ponder the idea for me that research is valuable for an audience somewhere. And part of our job as academics, and part of the role of the literature review, is to connect that research to that audience. So instead of offering this idea, when this blog from Gabriel was presented and discussed, then a whole series of people on social media started to repost it and discuss it. So what I find so amusing is the article's about there's too much staff. Reduce the staff, right? And so people started to repost and discuss the blog that said we need less staff. Great. Now, I particularly want to draw attention to the very interesting Rob Briner, and I like Rob's work, Professor of Organisational Psychology at Queen Mary, and he actually agreed that 80% of published academic research is, quote, meaningless clutter. And he went on to agree with the idea of Sturgeon's Law. Now, it was an odd parallel to make. For those who came in late, Sturgeon's Law is not from physics <laughs> or information literacy. It's derived from a comment about science fiction in the 1950s from, of course, Theodore Sturgeon. And the law read, quote, 90% of everything is crap. <laughs> End of quote. Now, as we discussed in the vlog last week, colleagues, isn't it amazing that people with a doctorate are trying to stop people following them and doing a doctorate? Isn't it amazing? The people who have been well published and gained from publishing are telling other people they really shouldn't bother. <laughs> Pretty convenient, eh? So how would any of us ever know? How would any of us ever prove that this statement is true? That this statement is reasonable? How do we determine the usefulness of publishing? Now, that's an interesting question. Now, once more, we see with these types of blogs and commentaries that older academics are eating their own young, reducing the publishing opportunities for higher degree students and early career researchers. So I thought I'd finish this vlog this week by respecting you, respecting your research, and yes, respecting your future. And I'm going to offer 10 laws. 
Normally we do Tara's 10 tips, it's a bit chatty. I'm over it, I'm following Sturgeon. We're gonna do the 10 Brabbers and Laws. <laughs> Staunch. 10 Brabbers and Laws for publishing, here we go. One, all research is valuable for a specific audience. Our role as researchers is to find that audience. Two, research is important. Disseminating research is more important. Three, peer review is a powerful and important service for the academic community. It enables quality. What separates an Instagram post from research is referee. Four, recognize that a range of knowledge systems, particularly from indigenous scholars, have been excluded through the history of our universities. It is important to consider indigenous knowledge as a central consideration. Five, embrace the diversity of scholarly voices. It's time to move from a university to a pluriversity. Six, read, read a lot, read now. Read what you disagree with. Just read. Seven. Reading transforms the world. Reading builds the literacies for citizenship. Eight. Writing transforms the world. Writing builds the connections for citizenship. Nine. Oh yeah, research can be meaningful and important even if it is not cited. Citations are an inelegant proxy for reading, influence and scholarly impact. And ten, question anyone who refers to research as, quote, meaningless clutter. Back books over blogs and articles over ambition. Now there are so many discussions that all of us can make right as scholars and, and we need to promote this knowledge system for your present and yes your future. And we do need to ask these questions who you are, what you're writing, why does it matter. But no but know that research is all we've got <laughs> to address the crises in our world. Climate, food, water, population, public health, public education, citizenship, just to name a few. Therefore, I just want to finish off with the legendary Dora. Dora could change your life. The Declaration on Research Assessment. And they argued that we need to improve how we think about the outputs of research and how they are evaluated. Now, Dora was developed in 2012 from a really unusual source during the annual meeting of the American Society for Cell Biology in San Francisco. It now covers all disciplines with outreaches to publishers, to funders, and yes, to scholars. Powerfully, Dora addresses the importance of, hang on to yourself, the structural inequalities in academia and the necessity to build community engagement. So Dora confirms how journal impact factors can and are gained and recognize the value of celebrating the diversity of research outputs beyond the peer-reviewed article. Now, Dora encourages, so important, clear authorship practices. So with the specific contributions of each author acknowledged, respect, and their focus remains on supporting high quality knowledge rather than relying on proxies that perpetuate inequality. Wow. And it is important to remember that just because a funder or an industry partner or a professor argues that a particular topic is important today 
and 80% of research that's published doesn't matter, that statement is not future-proofing our society at its most basic. Look at the history of the people that have won Nobel Prizes and note the gap of decades between making the discovery and the value of that discovery being awarded. Today's clutter could and probably will be tomorrow's solution. So research in tough times. Read widely. Write courageously. Disseminate passionately. Produce great research and then work hard to find that audience. I wish you love, light and peace. Tea out.